So, anyway, on with the show. To start this story, we'll go back to the very beginning. In the winter of 1960, baby Mark was born to Mother Jean and Father Walt in San Rafael, California. Walt was a professor of geography at San Francisco State College and Jean a homemaker. Mark was the middle child of three between older sister Karen and younger sister Linda. Walt's career caused the family to move frequently and they bounced back and forth between the Midwest and California. Young Mark got to experience the Wisconsin and Illinois winters and the California sunshine. Little Mark was a fun-loving and independent child. He enjoyed pranks, and his sisters can attest he could commonly be found with a slingshot in hand. Flinging paper wads in restaurants and making fart jokes were the norm. This concerned his parents, who had a much more conservative and traditional outlook. He rode his bike everywhere through the neighborhoods of Tiburon, California, and could frequently be found on sunny days at the local Glenwood swimming pool. Gene and Walt were both cultured and well-traveled, and they wanted to give the same experience to their kids. Gene took the kids to museums in San Francisco, Chicago, and the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. On driving trips across the country, the family went to numerous national parks and historical monuments, and they frequently went camping at Yosemite. One of my favorite stories about my dad's childhood is about Ralph, my dad's pet alligator. He was about 12 years old and living in Illinois, and he gave his mom an ultimatum, either wanting a boa constrictor or a caiman alligator. Finally, his mother gave in, so they bought a little alligator at the local pet store, which was apparently normal at the time. My dad lived in the basement, so Ralph lived in the basement with him. Young Mark would feed him goldfish, and as he grew, things got a bit out of control. Ralph would sometimes escape and run around the basement, and one time he almost bit my dad's finger off. So his mother said, that's enough, and they took Ralph at about three feet long to the Peoria Zoo. Wherever they were living, they always spent summers in Tacoma at Mark's grandparents' beach house. It was a little log cabin built in the late 1940s, and it was one of Mark's favorite places throughout his life. Those summers gave Mark time to learn from his grandparents, who were role models of hard work and intellect. His grandfather, William McRae, introduced Mark to engineering and all things mechanical. Mark would frequently help his grandfather with building projects at the beach. At the family beach cabin, young Mark and the other kids roamed free. It was nestled in between a large forest and the openness of the Puget Sound. While he was there, Mark came to love all activities in and around the water. This is best described by his childhood friend and beach neighbor, Brian Lynn. Whether we are fishing or swimming, or having seaweed fights, playing on the raft, water skiing, buying boats, fixing up boats, sinking boats, um, or just sitting on the porch having a couple of beers. Lots of great memories of you and our time together. So Bradley, are there any other reasons Dad got into water sports? Dad, he got in a bit of trouble. He ended up lighting a hill on fire as a kid, and as his punishment, he was made to uh, join the swim team. That was one of his two options, and he took it. Uh, but after that, he really didn't need any encouragement. When he became a parent, he was happy to share all of his aquatic interests with us. He dove for sand dollars at our beach house on the Puget Sound, which us kids would then skip. He took scuba lessons with Neil and I to help us get scuba certified. He went on these icy midnight swims with us that sometimes you could see the phosphorescence in the water since it was so late. And he spent countless hours driving, towing, and fixing our sport boat. That love of his for all things aquatic, it must have rubbed off on me because I'll take just about any excuse to put on his same 90s swim trunks 
and dive in the water. Moving on to Mark's early adult years, the things Mark's parents valued most were education and enrichment. They always encouraged him and his sisters to be dedicated in school and to participate in extracurricular activities. For dad, this meant playing cornet in the Turlock High School marching band, acting as a photographer and editor for the school's yearbook and newspaper, and joining the golf, water polo, and tennis teams. Dad definitely had a bit of fun in his high school years. One time, he spent a full summer drinking beer and playing Yahtzee. A group of four of them called themselves the Yahtzee Messiahs and rolled over two million points in Yahtzee games. Mark went on to pursue an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering and drank a lot of beer while he was at it at Washington State University. Go Cougs! After college, Dad joined the Coast Guard. He valued service to one's country, and he also wanted to fly helicopters. After officer candidate school, he was assigned to New Orleans, where he said he survived to Mardi Gras. One of his favorite memories from the Guard was sailing on the historic ship, the Eagle, from New London, Connecticut, to the World Fair in New Orleans. Overall, in Mark's early adult years, adventure and exploration were foundational. Some of the most notable adventures included driving to the Grand Canyon and solo biking the North and South Islands of New Zealand. This set the scene for many adventures to come. Dad. Um, I met Mark when I was a summer intern at the Campty Mill. I was working the switchboard temporarily, and I remember this handsome young fella come striding down the hall. He had a sense of ease when he walked, and as he got closer, I noticed his brilliant blue eyes and his warm smile, and I knew I wanted to get to know him better. The ladies in the accounting office helped by um, sending me on errands down to the construction office and um, in hopes that I would, might run into him, and luckily it worked. He was nine years older than me, and so he had obviously had a lot of time to live and to um, you know, be exposed to a lot of things that I hadn't been exposed to yet. Um, and he was more than ha happy to share those experiences with me, and then we had a lot of experiences of our own. Um, before having kids, we went on a fabulous trip to Greece, um, Turkey, and England. My brother was in England at the time studying, and we went and stayed with him. As with any relationship, it wasn't always easy, but with Mark, it was always worth the effort. We shared many wonderful adventures, we were blessed with three remarkable kids, and we made a lifetime of memories in our 32 years of loving each other. I will treasure the time we had together. Hey, sweetness. I'm just headed to bed. Brick's giving me a ride to the airport at 4.30 tomorrow morning. He's got a flight as well. And uh, she'd be home by 11.30 or noon. Anyway, I look forward to seeing you. Uh, take care. Sleep tight. Bye. What I wouldn't give to have that call again. One thing I'll never forget about my childhood is the feeling on Sunday mornings in our house. We always made it a point to have family breakfast together, and my dad would make waffles.
We enjoyed each other's company, and there was a warm and comfortable feeling. We'd share about our week and thoughts on the one to come. It was a time when everyone was at ease, and Dad's presence helped make that environment. I have distinct memories of him on those mornings. Before breakfast, I can picture him sitting by the wood stove with his old guitar, strumming a few chords. His nose might still be red from an early morning run in the moonlight. When I was up, I'd smell his black coffee and see him with the Oregonian comic section in hand. He posted the best comics on a wall in the kitchen, so when we walked by, we could have a joke to brighten our day. And it was almost always enough to make me at least crack a grin. <laughs> Drench the, the waffles. With lots of butter. Yeah, lots of butter. Over the years, I appreciated so many things about Mark. One of the things I appreciated the most was that he demonstrated his best traits for Neil, Bradley, and Leah and tried to instill those traits in them. One thing for sure was his sense of humor. He always taught Neil and Bradley and Leah life's way too serious and that we all need to have some fun along the way. I see you. I see you. I see you. You got a silly looking face. You got a silly looking face. This is Neil before his tonsillectomy. <laughs> and now after his tonsillectomy. <laughs> he showed that the things that were the most important, like education and taking care of your home, were things that were worth spending the money on. He demonstrated focus, determination, and work ethic, whether in his job or at home. He displayed a sense of humility and was never proud or boastful in front of them. He fueled their imagination with wonderful bedtime stories, and he loved to read books to them that really instilled a love of reading. He jumped on the bed, he danced around the living room, and he shared his hobbies with them and tried to show them how to have fun. And yesterday he started using a spoon to eat. His tail's not big enough for the two of us. This tail's not big enough for the three of us. Okay. Okay. This tail's not big enough for the five of us. That's why we had to move to the country. <laughs> you provided them with an example of how to care for others more than you care for yourself. You showed them how to be a great dad. And Mark was a wonderful uncle to his nephew and niece, Sean and Hannah. I think my dad kind of had a soft spot in his heart for me because I was definitely his baby girl. Ready to go. The next thing you see will probably be a spanking baby girl. And here. Watch this. Auga. Oh, that got her. <laughs> hey. Hi, Leah. She had a big day today. I think one of the best demonstrations of this was when we would go to father-daughter dances together. I remember I was pretty little, and I would put on my Velcro shoes and my red dress and come out. My hair was all done, and he would say, looking good, Lee. He loved to dance. He would pick me up for the slow songs, and it felt like I was dancing in the clouds because he was so tall compared to me. I don't know what I'll do when it comes time for my wedding dance, but I feel like he'll be sharing it with me as he has so many times before. It was my fifth grade project, and I was involved in kind of picking what happened here, but really dad was the firepower behind it, uh, was a trebuchet. And that is a like medieval to renaissance siege engine 
that uses a counterweight and a long arm and kind of a sling at the very end to whip big, you know, usually pieces of stone or anything else you might want to sling out of it to just whip those off into the distance. And Dad went all out and built one for us as a part of this project. And it was downsized, not going to throw any chunks of masonry anytime soon, but it would hurl a good tennis ball or a lacrosse ball. I remember watching and being present for that process as he looked up online tutorials and sketched out some of the pieces that were going into this. We adjusted the mass of that counterweight to really get the right momentum on the swing. It was the amazing sort of backyard project that most kids might dream about, but very few ever get to experience. I have these vivid memories of standing up in our, our field up the hill and having tennis balls slung by the trebuchet and me and a bunch of Boy Scouts trying to catch them. Uh, and also with the lacrosse ball, we chose a, a less wise angle of shot and uh, dented our neighbor's grill. Yeah, sorry, Greg and Donna. <laughs> One of the things that I thought was admirable that my dad did was uh, try to introduce me, my brother and sister, to activities that he had really enjoyed as a kid. And one of those was Boy Scouts. When he was growing up in California, Scouts was absolutely foundational for him. I got to go backpacking all over the state and enjoy the, the forests, the, the mountains, the rivers, and, and just have a ton of fun. One of his favorite memories was skinny dipping in an alpine lake in the Sierra Nevadas. Scouts was also an outlet for expressing traits that he really valued, like independence and, and self-sufficiency. When Bradley and I were old enough to be in Scouts, uh, Dad encouraged us to participate. He didn't force us. He enthusiastically led the way, and, and we followed. In fact, I remember him uh, being so excited about some of the outings that he would, he would be packed before us and, and ready to go. He went with us on dozens of outings to locations all over the Pacific Northwest. Some of my favorite memories in Scouts were some of the mountaintop views and just being, being amongst the evergreens. And it was great being able to spend those weekends with, with Dad. When Bradley and I got our eagle, he was, he was extremely proud. I mean, it's usually six to seven years of work to attain that rank, and I know that it meant a lot to him personally when he got his eagle, and then also uh, when Bradley and I did. I think Dad appreciated Scouts for the tenets of the organization as well as the skill building and the outdoor exploration. And there are some character traits that uh, a Scout learns uh, called the Scout Law. I want to particularly highlight the helpful courteous and cheerful aspects of the Scout Law. A lot of people who met him will remember his big smile and his natural charisma. I was always impressed by his ability to, say, just be at, like, say, a bus station or on a, on a plane and turn to the person next to him and be able to essentially make a friend. Um, st strike, up, strike up a conversation, get them laughing, and ultimately just make them make them feel comfortable. So I think it was the warmth um, that he showed. In my estimation, there's nothing sexier than a man who's incredibly capable of building and fixing just about anything. Neil will be the first to walk on this page. There, can you break him in, Betty? Break him in. 
Just don't break them. Just break them in. <laughs> yeah, can you break them in for us? <laughs> Mark loved fixing practically everything around our home, and he loved the fact that he could save money by not having to pay to have the tasks done by someone else. From building himself a shop, to doing extensive brickwork, to sprinkler systems in our yard, to expanding the wiring system in our home, he could do it all. It seemed like Dad was always up in the barn working on a new project. From the house, you could see his workbench light on, and as you got closer, you could hear the sound of rock music playing and the wood lathe turning. Many of Dad's crafts were practical, but he also had an artistic side. Perhaps the best expression of his inner artist was his wood turnings. He gathered, preserved, and eventually turned many types of exotic wood on his lathe. There are wood rounds in the rafters of his shop that he had been keeping for 20 years just in case he finally had the right idea for a particular piece. When I was in high school, my dad taught me to use the wood lathe. It's a tricky thing to become skilled at. A single bowl can take tens of hours to plan and cut, but it can be ruined in an instant. If the tool hits a knot in the wood, or too much pressure is applied, the workpiece can be completely destroyed. It takes patience and a steady hand to sculpt the piece to perfection. and the sculptor has to continuously keep his cutter sharp. I never found a dull blade in my dad's shop, and that says something. I was never nearly as skilled as he was, and he would be too modest to say this, but in my eyes, he was an artist on the lathe. Looking at the geometry of his pieces, I knew I couldn't replicate them without his years of experience. When I saw the thin walls, complicated grains, and near-perfect finish on his pieces, I sometimes thought, how did he do that? perspective from my own work gave me an appreciation for his craft. Mark brought the same high standard of quality to his professional career in the paper industry. 
He worked for Willamette Industries, then Weyerhaeuser Corporation for over 30 years as a project engineer, then an engineering manager. I worked in his engineering office one summer, and I realized that making paper is much more complex than most people appreciate. It's a process with dozens of steps and sophisticated chemistry, and the facilities are absolutely massive. There are boilers the size of houses, and the paper machines for making the rolls stretch longer than a football field. Dad was a mechanical engineer, meaning that he designed systems with hundreds of pumps and valves and miles of pipe. He always said that he enjoyed the creative problem solving and the variety of the job. What do you have to like to do to be an engineer? You have to like to figure things out. That's, the, that's probably the key thing. And uh, actually be able to try and connect the dots as to what makes something work. He worked on some of the largest paper mills in the U.S., and his projects frequently cost tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. I remember he was always proud that his projects were done on time and on budget. He also had a knack for finding creative ways of saving money by reusing equipment or finding unique uses for existing spaces at the mills. I have a letter from the mill manager at Valiant, Oklahoma, for whom Mark completed a project as mechanical engineering manager. I want to pass along a few thoughts relating to the Valiant Recovery Boiler project. Mark Olson worked very hard and delivered over and over again. He designed a scenario that had never been done before, but is working well. It was an extremely cost-effective project at a price that I would challenge cannot be matched. Mark and his team in Portland did an excellent job, and I would like to thank all of them. Mark was also well-respected as a leader, communicator, teacher, and mentor. I think this is best expressed by a letter Mark received from one of his junior engineers. Mark, I can't begin to express how thankful I am for all the opportunities you've given me. You've always encouraged me while believing in my abilities, even before I believed in them. You've shown me great respect and always treated me as an equal. You're a great boss, but an even greater friend. My family and I thank you for always considering our needs. I know for a fact that he treasured the many close friendships he made in his years at work. He shared many laughs, beers, and adventures with his buddies from Willamette and Weyerhaeuser. They enriched his life, and he appreciated all of them. Dad was a, he was a very physical person. You know, he enjoyed rowing, boating, swimming, but most of all, I think he enjoyed running. He loved the self-imposed challenge of a contest, and that was marathons for him. The very first memory I have of Dad running was at one of his Portland marathons we were along the barricade, and he came barreling around the corner, uh, finish line in sight, and he was looking for us and looking for us, and he finally found us, and he ran up, gave me a kiss on the cheek, I think he gave you guys fist bumps or high fives, and he finished out the marathon. And then he'd always give me the rose, and maybe one of you guys the, um, the blanket. Metal. Yeah, the, the medal and the blanket maybe the banana. <laughs> His marathons were really impressive. He ran 35 in total, and one of them he was most proud of was his qualifier for the Boston Marathon. To qualify, he had to make it under three hours, uh, and he ran it in two hours and 59 minutes. For reference, that's running about six minute and 50 second miles for all 26.2 miles, which is, to me, quite a feat. You know, after and during his time with his marathons, he wanted to get us kids involved. And well, to that end, he took us on many loops of the, so we had a two mile loop that we did, as well as a three mile straight away. And uh, the paths of those runs are still etched in my memory as uh, I can remember doing them many, many times. 
And finally, in the end, he got to watch us as we ran our first marathons. Mine, uh, the Tacoma City Marathon, and with Leah, the Portland Marathon. I know he wanted to run them with us, but what he told us was the next best thing is watching us run them. So he was always really proud. I was never with him during the hardest miles of his marathons, where the body's screaming at you to just stop and you want to give up in utter exhaustion. In those moments, runners have to steel themselves to push through the pain. In 2020, we saw firsthand what those moments look like. Mark has always been such an independent and self-sufficient man. I remember the day that he received the preliminary diagnosis of ALS. We were together at OHSU Hospital, and after the diagnosis, we were sitting in the parking lot, and I told him I was willing to walk through anything with him, that I would be right there beside him, but I needed him to set aside a little bit of that independence and allow me to be on the journey with him. Um, I knew he could fight with grit and determination through just about anything, but what really amazed me was the grace that he showed during the battle with ALS. He allowed me and our children, Neil, Bradley, and Leah, to walk beside him every step of the way. He was wonderful with the hospital staff and all of the different medical care providers that he had by listening to their advice, and he was willing to try just about anything that showed promise. Over the course of two years, he tried the best solutions known to medical science as well as new therapies still in experimental stages. When you're fighting something that's considered incurable, you have to go all out for any chance of success. This was a full-time effort for, all, for him and for all of us, at home and on the road. We traveled around the country looking for novel approaches to a seemingly impossible situation. He had so many different medical treatments that he tried, but one of the most extensive was a neuron stem cell trial at the UC Irvine in California. Um, the medical research coordinator there got to know him really well over the 15 trips over an 11-month period of time. Jeanette really loved Mark, and she wrote this letter um, that she wanted um, us to have concerning her thoughts about him. Mark always had a way of making those around him feel comfortable. Even through extremely difficult times, he could always find reasons to smile and elicit smiles from all those around him. His sense of humor was a gift he shared with all. His perseverance and determination never went unnoticed. I remember him during one of the clinical trial visits walking circles around the hospital. He never stopped trying, he never stopped fighting. His fight continues in all of us that were blessed to know him and work with him. I knew from watching him for years that he was a hard worker, but now I realize that he was the hardest worker I've ever seen, bar none. He gained my deepest respect. Initially, he was angry and he was questioning, how could I have had heart disease issues and then ALS um, right within nine months after that? And he was actually doing volunteer work one day um, at the Day Center of Family Promise, and he was working on refinishing doors. And this is, um, he came home and he told me that he was thinking, why is this happening to me? And then he said the realization hit him. He's like, I've been so lucky throughout my life. He's like, I've been truly blessed. Um, he's like, if I didn't get another day, I had a wonderful life. I'll remember his knack for finding the little pockets of joy in life. I'll always remember that he got the job done the right way. I'll remember his air of mischief. I will remember the warmth of his touch and the love we shared. <laughs>